بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد And this is the matter of hypocrisy. A lot of times individuals may suffer from a form of hypocrisy without realizing that. And this comes from wanting peace and bliss and justice for oneself but not necessarily for others. And often the question is asked, how do we come closer to our Imam or how do we build a relationship with our Imam or how do we get to know the Imam better? or how do we personalize that relationship with him and this can be answered in many ways but one way is in aligning our values and our character to his not waiting that when he comes and establishes a system of justice then we will live by justice we need to learn to say that what will the world look like when he comes can I start living like that to the degree that I can Right. There may be things that are beyond our ability, but there may be things that are within our ability. As an example, time and again I have heard individuals from the Muslim community, unfortunately, who will boast of how well they have done in business and how they sold things at 200% profit or 300% profit or 500% profit. And there is a need to ask ourselves, are these the values by which the Imam lives by. If these are the things that we take pride in, that I got this for $50 but I was able to sell it for $300, are we going to be able to live in a system where this is not permitted? And what would our reaction be if we were taken to task or punished for having done such a thing? You see, so we want justice and good and wealth and bliss and comfort for ourselves but sometimes we neglect that aspect that we're not able to live in a society where justice has to prevail for everyone. This may be also in other forms. You may have been to places and countries where you will find Muslims cheating others. Uh, not necessarily Muslims only, it happens all over the world but our concern is primarily first as Muslims because it should not be expected of a Muslim. It could be understood of someone who does not believe in God but certainly not of a Muslim. So you may come across societies not necessarily here, where individuals who call themselves Muslims show a lack of integrity. They might overcharge you when they give you a ride in the taxi. They might overcharge you because you don't know the language or because you don't speak that language or they know you're a tourist, for example. Now, such individuals, they also pray, Allahumma ajjil farajahu, oh Allah, hasten the appearance of the Imam. They celebrate the 15th of Sha'ban. But will they be able to survive in a system where they cannot cheat people? There may be things that are around us in society that we are used to, but in our hearts we should be averse to them. We should not be acknowledging them and accepting them. For example, there is the system of interest. Now, I do not wish to discuss the fiqh laws and masail of taking interest and so on and the banking system and what the ulama have to say and so on and so forth. But overall we know that the system of, in, of interest is one that is meant to enslave people and to make the rich richer and the poor poorer. Now we may have to live with that sort of a system under certain circumstances and we might even have certain allowances from the maraje in the present time we live in. But that does not mean that in our hearts we love that system. Because when the imam comes that system will be abolished for sure. So now, can we live in a society where we earn a living, but we don't earn interest? For many, this would be very hard to accept. It may be easy to speak about it. But this is what I mean. There is pros and cons to living in a society that is not primarily a Muslim society. The advantages of living in a society such as ours in the West is that you are able to clearly see religion from culture if you choose to do so. Many individuals who come from the East or who live in societies that are predominantly Muslim, when you visit them, when you talk to them, when you see how they live, you find that they have confused culture and Islam. And a lot of times they're not able to distinguish one from the other. Nor do they take religion as something precious. They take it for granted because it is all around. They do not, for example, take a lot of pain to raise their children with Islamic teachings or bring them to the madrasa because if I don't raise my child, my neighbor will raise my child. 
Mahalla is there, there's somebody other, there's a mosque in every corner, the child will grow up as a good Muslim. A lot of times these individuals when they come here, they are overwhelmed and they stop praying, they stop fasting and so on and so forth. We've all heard of such uh, horror stories. But the disadvantage of living in a society that is not predominantly Muslim as well is that you grow up seeing things that desensitize us so that we no longer see what is wrong as wrong. For example, the fact that you grow up in a society where predominantly when you walk around in society you don't see hijab being observed because the majority are not Muslims. Now you live in a society where predominantly everyone is in hijab. That might be, so to speak, a cultural shock to many individuals. And so, Living in an Islamic society is a little different uh, and we need to love Islam and what it stands for and understand the philosophy behind its values in order to accept living in such a society. For example, in a true Islamic society with the Imam uh, uh, in, in, in control of the, the global Muslim society, there may be a system where everywhere there is congregational prayers being held, there is Friday prayers being held. Now we need and we have to attend those Friday prayers. Even the individuals who say Jum'ah prayers is not wajib, they say it's wajib in the presence of the Imam. But if all our lives we are against praying Jamaat prayers, we are against praying Friday prayers, then how would we adjust in such a society? If we cannot look beyond fighting and arguing over little things like you know, is this music allowed or is that music not allowed? Can I eat from here? Can I not eat from there? Why is hijab wajib? Why is it not? Then it would certainly be very difficult for us to exist in a society where not only Islamic values are upheld but enforced, where the system in the court of reward and punishment of justice is the Islamic hudud. You see, when the, it comes to the same issue of living in a society where the society drums into us certain ideas that these are old-fashioned and barbaric. Islam has its own philosophy, for example, where it upholds capital punishment or death sentence for certain sins and crimes, such as, for example, adultery or murder. Now, we live in a society where there is no capital punishment. If we suddenly had to live in a society where this is enforced, there are many individuals who all their lives prayed for the Imam without thinking of these things because subliminally they always believed that these were barbaric and these were things that were not acceptable. That this was old, that this had to change. The Imam cannot change the Sharia of Muhammad because the halal of Muhammad remains halal ila yawm al qiyamah and the haram of Muhammad remains haram ila yawm al qiyamah. In other words, we need to go from a position of simply following Sharia out of a sense of guilt or enforced or fear of hell to a point where we love Islam, where we cannot wait for him to come so that we can live in a society where true Islamic values are held. It is then and only then that I have a right to say that I pray sincerely and say Allahumma ajjil farajahu without any hypocrisy in me. So we really, really need to look inwards and ask ourselves, why am I praying for him to return? Is it because I'm fed up? Is it because I hate the enemies? I hate the West or I hate the Zionists or I hate this and that? Or is it because I really want to see Islamic values shared with humanity and a world that exists on these Islamic principles. Consider, for example, the history of the Jews and the Christians in the Middle East. When Rasulullah came, when he declared himself as the Prophet of Allah in Mecca, there were a lot of Jews living in Medina, which at the time was called Yathrib. And there were a lot of Christians living in an area that is called Najran, a group of whom had come for which the incident of Mubahala took place. When you read the books of history to say how did the Jews and the Christian end up in the Middle East, it is interesting to note that they came there because they had read in their books prophecies that a prophet would come from the Middle East. Which means the Jews primarily came to Medina waiting for the prophet. This was why they were there. And the mushrikeen in Mecca, the polytheists, were not waiting for him because they didn't have a scripture. They didn't have Torah or Injil. The irony of the whole thing is that when this prophet rose and declared his mission, who were the people who accepted him and who were the ones who opposed him the most? Initially, yes, he faced a lot of resistance from the Quraysh and he had to migrate to Medina. 
But even in Medina, the people who accepted him were the mushrikeen, were the polytheists, were the ones who worshipped idols. And then Mecca. The Jews who had been waiting for him all their lives, they are the ones who opposed him. They are the ones who fought him at Khaybar and Khandak and so on. There were some who changed and accepted him. But despite the proofs he gave them, if you read the Qur'an, the lame excuses and arguments they gave are listed in the book. Which is very, very ironic, isn't it? And we seek refuge with Allah from such an incident taking place with the Muslim community, where large numbers of us wait for the Imam, and large numbers of non-Muslims are oblivious to him. But when he establishes a world based on justice, then a large number of those who do not know him today accept him in droves. And those who claim to follow him deny him. History repeats itself, isn't it? So we need to ask ourselves what went wrong there and why would it not go uh, right with us. It is very, very important that we look at this. And this is not something that I am supposing or imagining. But we have this from a hadith. A hadith, one tradition that I read just today, which said that when the Mahdi salam returns, a large number of those who claim to follow him will deny him. And there will be people who worship the sun and the moon who will accept his message. So this is something that is there in the books, and it is something that we need to be uh, cautious about. The best way to identify the Imam is not through the signs and the miracles, nor through the intellectual proofs as much as through the purity of the heart. Because the heart will always, when purified, it will always testify to that which is just and true. It will always deny that which is false. The others will also play a role, knowing the signs are important. The miracles, the signs, that the, the, the things that are in the possessions of the Imam that he will produce, the Dhulfiqar of his forefathers, the Aba, the turban, all those signs that we have in books are, have their place. But it is the purity of the heart, we shall conclude, that will be the deciding factor on who accepts and who denies uh, um, the Imam. And this is true for all matters. We said yesterday when discussing the ayah, فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ مَرَضًا That whether we seek to accept God, the Qur'an itself says that it guides some and it misguides some. يَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا And we have discussed this ayah again in the past. That whether we wish to verify is the Qur'an the word of God, or whether we wish to prove the existence of God, or whether we need to understand the reality and the truth of Ali Muhammad, or whether we want to identify whether the individual in front of me is the Imam or not, the most striking proof and the greatest evidence will come from the purity of my heart. If you look at the Messenger of Allah again as an example, peace be on him and his family, when he came and began preaching his mission, he did show signs to the Quraysh. One of his most astounding signs was the splitting of the moon that the Quran testifies to. He showed them signs like taking pebbles in his hand and the pebbles would glorify Allah. Imam Ali alayhi salam in Nahjul Balagha talks of a miracle where he says that the Prophet summoned a tree and the tree came out and it walked towards him on its roots. So miracles like these were shown but they still denied the proof. Look at the people who accepted the message. The first ones to accept the message of Islam were the poor, were the downtrodden, were the oppressed, were the slaves. And what was their argument and reason for believing? It wasn't the fact that we saw him splitting the moon. It was the fact that this man tells us not to bury our daughters alive. It was the fact that this man tells us that women are human beings. They are not to be treated subhuman. In other words, they saw that he stood for truth, he stood for justice, he stood for human rights. He stood for that which was fair and equity for all human beings. And they were attracted to it foremost because they were oppressed and they were victims of those circumstances that he was against materialism, that he was against idol worship, that he was against that which demeans a human being. So on the same basis, if we purify our hearts, then when the Imam comes forth, because we know from the books of Ahadith, that there will come forth at least 60 liars claiming to be the Mahdi before the Imam. So there is no shortage of false Mahdis. In identifying the right one, we will know the right one because of the fact that he will not ask for people to worship him. He will not ask to control people. He will not want political power for the sake of it. It will not be a movement based on capitalism or materialism. It will be one that will speak for the oppressed. 
it will, it will be one that will speak against oppression and against injustices. So this purity of heart is very, very important.